Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to another episode of Advanced Topics. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about false sharing, and we're going to start with a brief presentation. So to give a little background, let's talk about multi-threaded applications. So we can break down um, the creation of multi-threaded applications into four steps. So we take this sequential computation, and then the first step is decomposition. So we'll decompose you know, all or part of a sequential computation into individual tasks. Then we take those tasks and in an assignment phase, we say, how are these going to map to different processes or maybe different threads within the same process? Then we go ahead and have this orchestration phase where we say, how are these different threads or processes going to communicate with each other? So all of our computation might not be independent and typically not all of your computation will be independent. Um, there are many examples where we have data sharing. And then we end up having our mapping phase where we say, here's our parallel program. How is it actually going to fit on our hardware? And there's optimizations that we can do at each of these levels, and there's things we need to account for. And one of these things is false sharing. So let's go ahead and get uh, started. But first, we'll talk about this very intuitive thing called direct sharing. So we might just have data sharing in our application. So we might just have multiple threads that are accessing the same data structure. So an example of this is with a histogram, right? So with a histogram, um, you know, binning each one of the elements is completely independent. So binning one element, um, is not influenced by any other data, say, in an array that you're trying to bin. However, the update to the bin counts, um, that is something that's going to be shared by, say, all of your threads. So all of your threads are, say, updating or incrementing these bin counts, and we need to make sure that that happens using some kind of synchronization, be it something like a lock or something like an atomic. So we need to take care of that. Um, and like we talked about earlier, that goes into this orchestration, right? Um, another you know, example where it's just read-only sharing is with this uh, ocean benchmark that uses temperature averaging. So we might just need to read data um, that's mapped to a different process, right? And so in that case, um, it's less of an issue because we're, it's just reading data. Um, but this example with histogram is especially important because doing something like writing uh, or multiple threads writing the same uh, say data structure uh, can end up leading to some pretty big performance hits. And the reason why is because the data is going to end up bouncing between different cores or different processors. So why does this happen? Why do we get this bouncing of data? Well, it all goes back to the fact that if we're doing, say, something like an atomic uh, increment of, say, an, an integer, basically what happens is that when one a processor wants to do an atomic increment, it has to go over to wherever the cache block currently is in maybe another processor or another core and has to invalidate that cache line and bring it over to its processor. So with cache coherence, we can basically make sure that we only have one writer in a system at a time. We could have multiple readers, but only ever one writer, right? So we have exclusive writes. Now, this can be a you know, pretty big problem in a, a parallel application because if everyone's trying to modify the same data structure or maybe the same piece of data, this cache block can start bouncing between different cores and we'll spend most of our time doing, doing these data transfers instead of some useful computation. So an example of this is, let's say we've got some piece of data D and it's shared by P0, P1, P2, and P3. So to say different threads running on different processors. Now, when P0 accesses the piece of data and it say wants to increment it, it gets moved to P0. But when P3, uh, P3 wants to do its update, this data block has to move to P3, then to P1 maybe, then to P2, and it can keep bouncing around until all the work is done. Now, we might end up just spending most of our time doing this data transfer instead of, say, just doing these increments. Now, um, false sharing is another type of sharing that's a bit less intuitive than direct sharing. So while with direct sharing, you know, basically we know, okay, we've got some common data structure that we want to share. Well, with false sharing, we're unintentionally sharing data. And this is usually a symptom of uh, data layout and architecture. So this occurs when unrelated data can get mapped to the same cache line. When it gets mapped to the same cache line, right, this bouncing around of this cache block, right, while we may have, say, one integer on a cache line that we need in one processor, we might unintentionally grab 15 other integers and bring it over to this processor and invalidate it in the other processor's core. It's important that we talk about the fact that it gets invalidated in P0's core because it's no longer going to have the most recent value, right? P2, P2 in this case is doing the right, right? So it's going to update this value. So whatever's in P0 is going to no longer be valid. So it gets invalidated. So let's look at how, uh, how something like false sharing you know, we can visualize this. So with something like 
you know, maybe a cache line with four atomic integers, A, B, C, and D. You know, maybe it starts out um, where P0, right, just tries to access A. And let's say that P0 has A, P1 is only going to update B, P2 is only going to update C, and P3 is only going to update D. So when P0 tries to update A, it grabs A, B, C, and D because they're on the same cache line. When P3 tries to update D, it grabs them all. Same thing with P1 and P2, right? So this is that false sharing. Well, P2 is only trying to say update C, it grabs A, B, and D as well. So we're gonna look at some benchmarks that kind of show this off and show how big of a problem it can be. So these micro benchmarks will have a single threaded one. We'll have one atomic integer that will just be updated by one thread. So one thread will do all the work. We'll have a direct sharing uh, example where we'll have, a, uh, we'll have four different threads that will all be atomically incrementing one integer. We'll have a false sharing benchmark where we'll have four integers that end up getting mapped to the same cache line and it'll be shared by four threads. And then we'll have a no sharing benchmark where we, we show how we can kind of avoid this false sharing by you know, playing around with the alignment of these atomic integers and making sure that they're all on their own cache line, therefore eliminating this false sharing. So let's go ahead and jump to the code and the profiling. So we'll go ahead and open up this uh, false sharing benchmark and this is all written um, in C++ using Google Benchmark. And so this is our work function. All it does is it, take an, it just takes an atomic integer by reference and then it just uh, increments it you know, 100,000 times. So for a single threaded benchmark, we're just going to call this function four different times. And the reason why we're using atomic int, even in the single threaded benchmark, is just you know for the sake of fairness when we're comparing against the multi-threaded ones that require this to be an atomic int. Um, we could also use something like um, an atomic reference to an integer, which is new in C20. So, and that's our single threaded benchmark, then we'll have our same var benchmark. So with this one, we'll go ahead and have um, one atomic int that will be, um, that will call this work function, um, or we'll have one, one thread, our main thread, that creates an atomic int, and then it will spawn four threads, each of which are just using the exact same atomic int. So this is that direct sharing. Then we'll have a false sharing benchmark, which will create four different atomic ints, but we'll look at how these get allocated, and we'll show that even though we created four different atomic ints, they end up getting mapped to the same cache line. And therefore, when we you know, launch four different threads, we end up getting the pretty much the exact same performance as the direct sharing one. And then we'll have our no sharing benchmark where we cr just create a struct, we call it a line type, but we give it alignment to 64 bytes. And this ba basically makes it so that, you know, on most systems that use 64 byte cache lines, no two atomic ints will get put on the same cache line. And it will have an atomic int inside of it as well. That's actually on the only thing that'll be in the struct and so we'll just create four um, of these aligned types, pass one to each of these different threads, and then join them at the end, and we'll run this benchmark as well. So let's go ahead and get started, and the first thing we'll do is just compile our false sharing benchmark with O3 optimizations, and let's go ahead and just run it and collect some numbers. So we basically see that for our single-threaded benchmark, it takes about 1.88 milliseconds, for our direct sharing benchmark, it takes about 7.47 milliseconds. And for our false sharing work, we created four atomic integers, it takes um, 7.54 milliseconds. And then for our no sharing benchmark, where we use that aligned type, it took 0 0.677 milliseconds, right? So even faster than the single threaded one. But that kind of makes sense because if each one of these four threads is doing, say, um, a quarter of the work, um, it should be a lot faster, right? Now it's important to note that um, there is a cost to spawning these threads, so um, depending on how many times you're doing that work loop or how many times you're doing those atomic increments, if you shrink that down to something like 10,000, it ends up being about the same performance, at least on my machine, between single thread um, and the no sharing one, because you know threads, you know, they take some time to spawn the thread and then join the thread. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, but now that we have some baseline numbers here, let's talk about how this um, how this data actually gets laid out in memory. So first let's look at atomic int.cpp. And all we'll do is create four atomic ints and just print out the, their addresses. So, um, and this is exactly what we do inside of our, um, our false sharing benchmark, right? With our false sharing benchmark, we just create four atomic ints and pass them to our four threads. So let's see how they get laid out in this atomic int.cpp. Uh, so we'll go ahead and just compile this um, and we'll run it and we'll print out the addresses. 
and we see that okay so where did these end up you know winding up in memory well a wound up at you know blah 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 ec um, b wound up at e8 um, c wound up at e4 and then d wound up at e0 they're all right next to each other so they're, they're really all going to be sitting on the exact same cache line so it's no wonder that you know, when, you know, the different threads start accessing their own, you know, atomic A, B, C, or D, they just end up grabbing them all. Now with our, um, with our aligned type here, where we see we aligned it to 64 bytes and it just has an atomic int inside of it, that's it. So let's see what happens uh, with this uh, same kind of setup. So we'll go ahead and compile align type and we'll run a.out. Now let's see how it looks. So one of them is at 8, 0, the other one's at 4, 0, the other one's at 0, 0, and the other one's at C, 0. Now they're all offset from uh, offset by 64 bytes from each other, or at least 64 bytes. Um, that being said, they're all going to be on a different cache line. The cache line size on my machine is 64 bytes. There's no way that two of these atomics can be on the same cache line. So that's how we were able to eliminate our false sharing and get this speed up. Um, compared to you know the false sharing and the direct sharing version, right? So this is 0.677 uh, milliseconds, about three times faster than even the single threaded version. But let's actually look at this from a uh, from a profiling point of view. So we can go ahead and uh, use perf, which you know goes ahead and accesses some of the performance counters. So we'll go ahead and use perf record um, on false sharing. And the first thing that we'll look at, let's go ahead and look at single thread, right? So we'll go ahead and look at, uh, say, single uh, thread. And this will go ahead and run the benchmark for three seconds, but only the single threaded one. And it will go ahead and generate a report for us. And we can see how it looks like um, you know, from a, an assembly point of view. So all of our time is being spent in single thread. And we see that it wound up just having these lock add L in here. right? So these are our atomic increments that are going on. So we're just going to be, you know, calling that work function four times, and you see we've got this, you know, pretty simple loop here with the jump not equals, where we're just decrementing down by one each time, um, and we're just going to do this basically four different times because because we call work four times, so all of our time is being spent on this lock add l right here. So how do the other ones look, right? So how does something like, um, how does our direct sharing one look? So let's go ahead and uh, run direct sharing instead so this one takes about seven and a half um, milliseconds versus that about two milliseconds or in this case about seven milliseconds we'll go ahead and do perf report we'll jump in and we see that each of our threads takes about a quarter of the time and we go in here again it's this lock add l so all of our time is being spent basically trying to do this atomic uh this atomic increment here um, and the same will be for actually all of our benchmarks so even for our um uh, our false sharing benchmark will look the same, and even our no sharing benchmark will look the same, right? So if we go ahead and run no sharing, right? As far as where our time is being spent, it's, it's still just being spent on this atomic increment, even though it's so much faster. Um, it's just that the overall program length um, is a lot uh, is a lot smaller. So still all of our time is on this lock, add L. All right, so let's go ahead and see how can we actually show you know, what's going on here? What's the big difference between the no sharing, the false sharing, um, and the direct sharing benchmarks? And it all goes back to what we said earlier about this cache coherence. I said that this cache block was going to be bouncing around between the different cores, right? So what was this go what does this kind of imply? It implies that we're gonna see a lot more L1 um, or a lot more cache misses when we have these invalidations going on. So when the cache block moves over and gets invalidated in one processor, the next time it tries to access that cache block, it's gonna have a cache miss. It's gonna to have to grab it from another core. So now let's look at just say the L1D cache misses. So we can use perf stat for this. So let's go ahead and use perf stat and we can do this, you know, dash D um, in order to get some more information and we can you know, keep giving it, you know, dash Ds to print out even more and more different performance counters here. So we'll run this on false sharing. And the first thing um, we'll start with is our uh, single threaded benchmark, right? So we'll run it with single thread first and let's see what we get. So um, once it finishes after running for three seconds, what we end up seeing, uh, we'll focus on the L1 cache. So we see that we have about um, you know, 1 billion or 1.3 billion loads to the uh, L1D cache. 
but only about three million misses, so about a point, you know, zero two, um, right? So about zero point two six of our loads end up being misses, right? So we have a pretty good hit rate here, right? That's pretty good, um, but that's not surprising, right? If we have a single thread that's just accessing the same atomic int over and over and over, we should really never miss on it. So now let's see what the um, what it looks like for instead of the single thread version. Let's see what it looks like for our direct uh, sharing version. And what we'll see is we'll see a huge spike in these L1D cache misses. So instead of having only about, let's see, it was only about 3 million misses here. Now we see it's gone up to 129 million misses, right? So 35.04% uh, of L1D cache hits, right? So huge increase in these misses here um, and that's where all of our time is being eaten up at and if you run this multiple times you might see different numbers here and the reason why is because this is all non-deterministic you know one thread might you know do 10 atomic increments um, before another thread actually requests um, or another thread is actually you know gets um, or invalidates that cache line so it's non-deterministic it all depends on the scheduling but what we see is overall we see a huge increase in these l1d cache uh, misses um, and if we go ahead and do this with the false sharing version, so this was direct sharing, we see that the false sharing one looks exactly the same, right? And that's why we have about the same performance. We see that the L1D cache, right? It's a 164 million misses, right? It's about the same as our direct sharing version, but that makes sense because it's just the same cache line. It doesn't matter if you know we're moving one int or four ints if they're all in the same cache line, because at the end of the day, we're just moving a single cache line back and forth. So now let's look at the no sharing version, right? So um, let's just run the no sharing benchmark. And what we end up seeing is our D caches go down again, right? Because each one of our threads, um, right? So here we see our D cache um, hits uh, or our L1D cache load misses. We're back down to 3.24%, not quite as low as it was originally, but significantly lower than our no sharing or rather our false sharing and our direct sharing versions. And that's why our benchmark takes 0 0.767 seconds versus something like six and a half or 6.8 milliseconds, right? Because we're eliminating all of this false sharing. So that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. It's a quick uh, benchmarking example and how we can show off um, how false sharing looks, you know, on, with a real benchmark. So if you wanna look at any of these or other examples, feel free to, you know, check out any of this content at github.com slash coffee before arch. So if you go into repositories, I have these, uh, uh, MuArch benchmarks. So these are just benchmarks to show off some microarchitecture features. So I have some on uh, branch predictors using virtual functions, um, prefetching, um, false sharing, uh, which we just looked at today, and then also showing off cache associativity um, as well. But that's going to go ahead and do it for this video. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.